so we're back at Ali Pally's The Masters Snooker Final continues live on BBC Two tonight from seven. So, time for an extra treat now. Down the years, the sport's been full of personalities. Some real game changers. Pop the reds, then screw back for the yellow, green, brown, blue, pink, and black. He's done it. it sounds so simple, and the top players in full flow, sinking ball after ball, have always made snooker look deceptively easy. But in truth, it's one of the most tantalising and testing games there is, demanding skill, strategic thinking, and immense concentration. And over the years, the masters of the game, with their different temperaments and styles of play, have frequently had millions of fans, like me, glued to our seats into the wee small hours. Here we look at the personalities responsible for some of snooker's biggest breakthroughs. They set new standards of play, helped to win massive television audiences, and made the game the worldwide phenomenon it is today. For those of you in black and white, it's the green over that bottom bucket that he's looking at. This is how snooker used to look. And it could be argued that snooker's enduring popularity today is down to one man, Sir David Attenborough. How on earth is that the case? Well, here's Stephen Fry with the answer. You may not remember or know that in the 1960s, Sir David was a senior manager and executive at the BBC and indeed he served as the second controller of the channel and director of programming. And when BBC Two became the first channel under his aegis uh, in 1967 to broadcast in colour, not just the first BBC but the first European channel, it was Sir David who is credited with taking advantage of this new technology, colour, by choosing snooker with its own bright colours as a showcase. And so on the 23rd of July, 1969, on BBC television, Pot Black was first broadcast. Televised snooker was born, and uh, from there, countless careers were forged. Yet another reason for the world to be grateful to Sir David Attenborough. But don't just take Stephen Fry's word for it. Here's the winner of the very first Pop Black Trophy, the great Ray Ridden, talking to Michael Parkinson on a similar theme. When it first started, it was black and white mostly. And then colour television came in and people could see the colours and distinguish one ball from another. And it, it attracted the elderly ladies, the young ladies, the elderly people. And they loved it because I suppose, I remember once being in Australia and this isn't so long ago, only about 10 years ago. And I'm coming out from this, this store and elderly ladies come in, so I sort of held the door open for her, you see, and she said, oh, thank you very much. And then she said, I know you, she said. And I said, well, I said, you know, impossible. I said, the first time I've ever been to Australia. Ah, she said, I've seen you on the box, she said, you know. She said, what do you do? I said, I play snooker. She said, pop black, that's what you are. Just like that. <laughs> I, you know, that's 11,000 miles away. I mean, I think that's terrific, isn't it? What's, what is, the, in fact, the fascination of this game to you, though? Oh, it's colourful. <coughs> it's artistic. You can, should or, may, or try to make the white ball do what you want it to do. Oh, it's ambiguous. How do you mean ambiguous? Well, one day you can do everything and another day you can do nothing. <laughs> you know, it's as frustrating as it is fascinating. Yes. Ah, oh, it just drives you around the wall sometimes. Welshman Reardon was the first player to dominate snooker in the age of colour. Alex Higgins was the game's thrilling genius, but Reardon brought a smiling consistency to the table, winning the World Championship six times in the 1970s. His nickname may have been Dracula, but he was one of the game's nice guys, and had a touch of the old-school entertainer about him too. Did I ever tell you that story? What story? There's a story of a, of a company director, actually, and he em employed this, this new secretary, you see. And tell me the story as we walk over the table, because you're going to get him to Go on. Well, they overworked one night, and um, the, the director said to the secretary, he said, look, he said, I'll take it. Hello. How are you doing? 
That was very so unfriendly. Uh, I'll take you home, you see. Well, you see. Okay, she said, it's late, you know, I've been working hard all day. So they get to her flat and he, she said, would you like a cup of coffee? I said, love one. So they go in and she said, look, we've been working very hard today. She said, would you like something to eat? So they had something to eat and then he had some wine and liqueurs. And, and of course, eventually, he's taken her to bed and made love to her. And then he says to her, he said, look, he said, it's two o'clock in the morning. I must go home now to my wife. He said, have you got some whiskey? And she said, yes. So she dabbed it all on his face and under his chin. And he said, have you got a block of billiard chalk? Uh, well, she, he said, yes, I've got a chalk. block of green billiard chalk. You see? So he goes all down his front with his billiard chalk. And he goes home to this very irate wife. And he said, look, darling, you're not going to believe this. He said, but you know, I've got a lovely secretary. We work late today. And I've taken her home. And She's prepared me a meal, we've had some wine, the cure is, uh, I've gone to bed and I made love to her. She said, you tell lies. She said, you reek of whiskey, you've covered him, you've been down the club again. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> is, there much, is there much gamesmanship goes on in, uh, in this game of yours? It seems such a sort of gentle game, you know. Is there well, much... I suppose psychologically there is, of course, but on the table, uh, they play in a very gentlemanly fashion, actually. Yes. I mean, if someone was to foul a ball with a finger or a piece of the apparel, they would get up, even if the referee hadn't said it, they'd say, sorry, it's so personal to, to interfere with the, with the ball itself, actually. Yes. But, I mean, whatever cheating, if you like, goes on, goes on in the mind yes, between yes. players. Yeah, right. But you could get a situation like this, that if you didn't have a, a referee and he wasn't actually on the ball, then you say, well, you, as you can see, I can't pop the lead in there because I'm behind the front red. So what you do, you just get down nice and steady and, and pop the red, of course, you know. I see. Yeah. Um, I think I see, but how was that cheating? Well, because well, I'll play that in a sort of a slow motion. Why? Right. What really happened was that I struck the white ball and then went like that. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that. <laughs> Now, of all, Ray, of all these tricks that you do, well, they're not tricks, actually, they're the shots that you do in the exhibitions, um, which is the most difficult one to do? Oh, that would be the machine gun shot, actually. What's that? Well, I was afraid that you were going to ask me that, actually. That involves the use of all the, the colours. Just the coloured balls and one Coloured balls. Right. Well, then, this is, a, this is not a trick shot at all, actually. No. This is just a purely a touch shot, quick eyesight, quick reflexes. Where, as you can see, I've spread the colours out, leaving a gap in between each one in order that one can pass one another to go into the far pocket. And what we're going to do, we're going to hopefully strike the white first. The white to go into the pocket last. So we strike the white, pocket the coloured balls, and the white goes in the pocket last. Well, uh, that's what should happen, as we say. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time he's done it right today. <laughs> the 70s and 80s saw Ray Reardon and the rest of Snooker's Elite become as familiar to TV audiences as the cast of a hit sitcom, with their unfashionable waistcoats and carefully fashioned nicknames. As well as Dracula, there was the Hurricane, Tony the Cat Mio, Jimmy Whirlwind White, and Big Bill Werbenuk, who seemed to down a pint with almost every frame he played. And then there was the unlikely superstar with more nicknames than all of them put together. Steve Davis was variously known as the Nugget, Romford Slim, the Plumstead Potting Machine, and the Ginger Wizard. But the name that really struck home with the public was interesting. It was coined by those wags at ITV's satirical show, Spitting Image. Although, Steve Davis sometimes only had himself to blame for his somewhat nerdy image. Well, George, how do you set up a computer to judge the comparative difficulties of pots on a snooker table? But what interesting Steve and his maverick manager, Barry Hearn, were doing to the game was genuinely interesting, helping to turn it into a serious money-making industry. 
We joined them here in 1981, the year Davis first put a stranglehold on the game, winning both the World and UK Snooker Championships. What's it done to you, do you think? What's it done to me? Fame. Oh, lots of pennies. <laughs> Were you aware that all this would happen? Mm. The, the, the razzmatazz and the, the, the offers and that all coming in, yeah. Really? Mm. I've got a good manager. Is that what you were, you, you were aiming at and making a lot of money? No. I was aiming to become the best snooker player in the world. My job was to win on the table, because that's, that's enough of a job, as far as I'm concerned. And that's a full-time occupation, is playing snooker. The good manager. Hello, Barry Hearn. Also known in the business as Barry Earn. Yes, well, if you're talking about... No, if you're talking about an afternoon and evening... See, I'd do... If we were in your area, we'd do 12.50 for the night time, but an afternoon session would be an extra 500, so that's 17.50 plus VAT, plus any expenses that Steve incurs. We don't do anything cheap for Steve Davis. The first year, we set our income level. So I can't even remember the figure. I think it was twenty thousand pounds. We went well past it. The second year we set, we said we should do fifty, and we went well past it. This year we've set a quarter of a million, and hopefully we'll go well past it. Snooker's first millionaire in the making learnt the tricks of his trade here in Romford at one of Barry Hearn's halls. The game has always been popular, but when television coverage turned top players into superstars, lads all over the country started dreaming of being the next Steve Davis. They too seek fame and fortune, although he insists that money isn't really the spur. Obviously, once you attain a certain level of money, or you, you start earning a certain level of money, if that was to drop down by any, any sort of appreciable amount, you, you, you'd miss it. But... Um... I don't wake up in the morning and think, ha-ha, like I can go out and buy something if I want to. I might wake up in the morning and think, yeah, I'm world champion today. But uh, not actually, not actually think of the money. It's nice to have it, but um, it's much nicer to be um, the world champion at something that you fell in love with at 14 and, and all of a sudden, nine years later, you've won the biggest competition in the world at snooker. That's more important to me. Yeah. I just happened to pop upstairs to the club in Romford and there was this tall, skinny kid playing snooker. Great long locks of hair and I wouldn't say his backside was coming out of his trousers, but it was close. And he just, uh, I don't know, you find this with, with champions and they, they just seem different. They exude a charisma of unbelievable control. I mean, he just looked so dedicated. Steve Davis goes three points ahead. The curtains now beginning to fall on the Coral UK Championship 1980. As the 23-year-old Londoner from Plumstead, Steve Davis, making his debut in a big-time championship, the first time he's appeared in a final, is about to don the crown of UK champion. I'm sure as the years go by, you will see him, as I hope to, wear the world crown. November last year, and the beginning of a bonanza. Steve now holds seven major professional titles. Nobody frightens him because in the early days, all the champions had been lured to his table by the astute Barry Hearn. It was nice because uh, he turned Romford into what was then called the graveyard of the professionals because he went 13 games without being beaten. And of course, it was uh, not only a costly experience for some of these players, but also from a prestige point of view, as far as the media was concerned, there was this young kid coming along and beaten six times champion Ray Reardon, or annihilated Terry Griffiths. You know, these were the sort of things we wanted because unless the press report accurately and often enough on a player, you just don't get the invitations into major tournaments. So really, in those early days, it was a question of experience, trying to put him through arduous travelling, big money matches, knowing that there was thousands of pounds of working-class 
people's money on it. And you, it's a, the type of pressure you can't begin to explain when someone walks up to you and says, best of luck, Steve, I've put my last ten pounds on you. And you know, it is, really is his last ten pounds. I mean, that's an added dimension of pressure. But he came through it all very well, and of course he learned as he went. Well, you get this terrible quote in Snooker about a misspent youth. And the only person that's never said it to me is Steve's bank manager. He loves it. He thinks the best spent youth you could ever have. Take this off. Yeah, yeah right. Oh, yes, that's nice. Listen, I'm a little bit worried about the gloves. I don't... Barry Hearn controlled everything off the table and was determined to turn the nugget into a gold mine. Do you want to take off the gloves? The gloves get the big E. All pictures must reflect the clean-cut image of Barry Hearn's boy who gets £25,000 a year to appear in the Star newspaper. That's lovely. Is this outfit all right? Yeah, the only, lost the gloves. We're all right. The only thing I'm worried about is, you know, is the side. Because I think a lot of Steve's... Afraid we left The 15 and 16 year old fans will, you know, they will be uh, getting very jealous. The good manager always tries to please the fans. So does the Daily Star. It's strange what, uh, what is a turn on to women, isn't it? Because we carried, uh, the morning after he won the World Championship, a pin-up picture, which he laughed about because he makes fun of his own physique, because he's a very slender lad. But we had him bare-chested. We had him topless on page one and awarded him a gold star. We have some certain gold star awards for people who make major achievements. And the response to that picture was unbelievable. And the response was all from young girls and young women because they thought it was very appealing. You've got a reputation of being really cool, haven't you? You look cool. Some people misinterpret it as cocky. Yeah, they do. Well, that's, uh, that's something I'm not particularly bothered about as far as if people want to think that, they can think that. Um, you can only play the game the way you can handle the pressure. And the way I handle the pressure is by playing it as cool as I can. Steve's schedule now is so hectic as to be suicidal. Absolutely suicidal. I appreciate this is a, a potential problem for normal players. It's no, not a problem for Steve Davis. Because he's not normal. He gets tired, the same as most humans, but you've got to look at him as a night worker. When you or I are in bed, he's driving home from somewhere. When you and I perhaps get up in the morning, you know, Steve's not up till midday. You know, lots of people have said to me, you know, don't work him too hard, two days a week's enough. To me, that's a load of rubbish, absolute rubbish. You're there to do a job, you're there to play snooker. A year later, Davis showed he was definitely the man for the job when he made history by completing the first maximum break in an official competition, which also just happened to be the first 147 to be captured by TV cameras. But you can imagine the tension that's building up in young Steve at the moment. 125. Well, well Steve is he's looking very, very calm. Normally this would be elementary, but under these circumstances, every pot is so difficult. Come on, come on round. 129. Let that a bit further. Well, if anybody can knock these three balls in, this man can. Now we're going to have to see a super shot here. Well, come on, Steve. Pull, pull a fabulous shot out. I'm sure you can do it. Come on, get in. Fabulous shot. Fabulous shot. And this is it. The first 147 break on television. 140. Well, I'm shaking. And I'll bet, right, I'll bet Steve at this moment can see the pocket closing up and closing up and Come getting on, Steve. smaller. Come no. A year later came another 147 milestone, this time pulled off by Canada's Cliff the Grinder Thorburn. In 1980, Cliff Thorburn had become the first player from outside the UK to win the World Championship. 
his defensive tactics frustrating the quixotic brilliance of Alex Higgins. And then, three years later, Thorburn notched up the first ever maximum break in the World Championship. His careful, measured approach, helping to see him through the almost unbearable tension. Have a little break here. It's a difficult <laughs> Well, what a, what a sensible fellow. At a stage like this with just one red left, he stops and blows his nose and says, let's have a break. And if he can take this red and the black, the colours will be on their spots. Oh, what a moment this is. It is truly electric here. If only we could tell the audience not to applaud just for the remainder of this break. Thorburn went on to reach the final in 1983, but was thrashed by Steve Davis. In 1984, Davis won the title again, beating Jimmy White. Then in 1985, he reached yet another final and was looking to make it three in a row, the clear favourite against Northern Ireland's Dennis Taylor. It looked like being another perhaps less than interesting victory. Instead, the underdog in the upside down glasses overturned all expectations. It all came down to the 35th and final frame and the final black ball, which seemed remarkably resistant to being potted. Even though they tried, and tried <laughs> and tried and tried and tried. No. This is really unbelievable. Yeah. He's done it. It was probably snooker's greatest night, and it turned Dennis Taylor into a national hero. The world snooker champion Dennis Taylor has returned to his hometown for the first time since his victory over Steve Davis. The townspeople of Coal Island in County Tyrone turned out in their thousands to welcome their most famous son, Neil Bennett reporting. There wasn't a place to be had in the tiny town square as Coal Island welcomed home its conquering hero and his reception was fantastic. With calm restored, the celebrations began and Dennis Taylor was made mayor for the day. When finally he could make himself heard, he spoke to the town which he's put on the map. I'm not usually lost for words, but it's a little bit difficult to find words to describe. I mean, I was brought up here and was here until I was 17 and spent many happy hours around the town here. In fact, I think I might even have pinched a packet of sweets out of McGlinchey's there. <laughs> They'd have given him the entire contents today and a lot more besides, after a day and a week which the town of Coal Island will never forget. Now, when you, when you returned to Coal Island, to County Tyrone, it must have been an enormous, very emotional reception for well, you. Well, it was abs it was just like a dream because I was only in there for, for two and a half hours. And uh, the first trip back was to Belfast where I was playing in the Shankill Leisure Centre, which was terrific reception. And then to go to the actual hometown, how they organised that in a couple of days, 
I'm never believing. The population it. of Coal Island swelled about 20 times, didn't That's it? That's right. Well, there's about seven or 8,000 there, and I think there must have been 25, 30,000 people in the time. I talked, was lucky enough to talk to Barry McGuigan some time ago, and he's a man who manages to transcend the religious and political boundaries in Northern Ireland, and you're another one. You can... I think that's probably why there were so many people in Cull Island, because Cull Island's 99% Catholic, and uh, the Shankill, where I played, is uh, predominantly Protestant. And over the last 10 years, I've had some of the top players over there, and we get a fantastic reception no matter where we go to. And uh, to win the World Championship and get that reception is amazing. It's funny, sport seems to get over all the barriers in Northern Ireland. Yeah, it? well, it's, it, it gives you a personal, a nice feeling inside uh, to see everybody together there. If I think that the biggest one was that, I don't know whether it showed it on the television, but the, uh, the Reverend from the Church of Ireland, I thought he was going to fall off the platform. He was over, he said I was the most fa famous person in the world. <laughs> <laughs> that was going over the top, wasn't it? What about Steve Davis? Has he spoken to you since? Yeah, Steve's back to his old self again. He's quite a nice fellow. A lot of people get the wrong impression of Steve yeah. Davis, and uh, he gets a little bit uptight on the snooker table, but uh, yeah, he's a, he's a grand, he's a family lad, he's got a good family, a nice yes, I think it was slightly unfair that he took a lot of stick for his reaction on the big night, but I mean, he must have been drained of all emotion. Well, he was, as I say, he's that type of character that he lives for snooker, as he'll tell you himself, you know, I mean, I'm a little bit lucky, I've got, I've got the three children and the wife to go back to, and uh, it makes you forget about the snooker when you lose, so uh, he, he, he loves the game of snooker and lives for him. A family don't take any nonsense from you, even just because you're the, the world snooker champion. I can champion. forget about that. If I start getting on cloud nine, they'll sort me out. Yeah. So attitudes haven't changed at home, have they not? Not yet, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they ever You don't worry. think they're going to? I, I was just think. thinking that, that you, you won the snooker championship, but most of the contracts you would have signed prior to winning would have been for a certain fee, and now you're the world champion. You're probably going to work for the next six months for less than you should be. That's right. What, uh, is it 20 pounds we get for tonight, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I have a very special award to make to you now, and I... Um, why are you crawling on the floor? <laughs> I'm not used to women crawling up to me like that. <laughs> Actually, it's it's a right pain in the to be giving you this, to be honest, because it's for the highest ever British television audience at midnight. Is that right? <laughs> How many viewers did we get? Was it only eighteen and a half million? Well, I'm only allowed to appear on programmes that get more than eighteen million viewers. How many do you get, Terry? <laughs> Do you mean if you add the month together? <laughs> add all three. We don't do badly, but 18 and a half is something else. And in fact, you beat Coronation Street at midnight, Dennis. <laughs> I and I think, I think that that pastor was right when he said, because when you did win it, you well, certainly you were the most, well, certainly the, the most popular man in Britain. Well, and congratulations and well done. Thank that's, you very much. That's a simple you. gift from the BBC. <laughs> If snooker had been soaring in popularity before, now the whole country seemed to have gone snooker loopy. Barry Hearn was managing not just Steve Davis, but many of the other top players under the banner of the Matchroom Mob, which was great for them, but less good for music lovers. Although Steve Davis did claim he had some musical ambitions of his own. I would like to be. I would have liked to have been a DJ. Actually, I, I was. I was chatting to somebody trying to get on Round Table, but um, I'm not too sure. I think really what I would have done would, would be to work just to play snooker and sort of live. That would be my hobby. But um, I wouldn't have minded to be a, a musician or perhaps a psychiatrist. <laughs> But Barry Hearn and the Matchroom didn't have a total monopoly on talent. Some 400 miles north, the player who would eventually match Steve Davis's dominance of the game was already starting to generate a lot of attention. And as this Fly on the Wall documentary from 1988 demonstrates, Stephen Hendry also had a manager who could rival Hearn when it came to steering a career.
Coming to the table is the little giant of snooker, looking even younger than his 14 years. Still going to school, he... I was very nervous before I went on, but it made me play better. Um, I got on the table and I was putting balls because I was concentrating so much on trying to play well and trying to make a good impression. Oh, this is absolutely amazing, Ted, there. I mean, for somebody... Going back to the very first night and seeing Stephen, I knew that I'd seen something very, very special. I mean, obviously, I'd watched White, Davis, Higgins, but Stephen was something very, very special. Absolutely magic. And another beauty. I mean, it was like, probably, if you're into Bali, going to Bali and watching Nureyev, he was uh, just absolutely magnificent round the table. I don't think, uh, even today, the, the thrill you get just watching him in a match, the highs when you win, the lows when you lose, it's something special. 55. I think to be involved with somebody with the talent that he had, subject to him, going down the right roads, being directed down the right roads. Success was, it was there. I mean, there was no ifs, buts or maybes. He just had to succeed. A magnificent display of putting by Stephen Henry to pick up the Scottish title and the trophy. Seven, the great... <laughs> <laughs> Well, a magnificent performance then by 17-year-old Stephen Hendry, put there by his father, and he overcomes Matt Gibson of Glasgow at 10 frames to 5. He has a natural temperament, which is his greatest asset. His temperament is absolutely perfect. Naturally, as a young man, he's got a very, very keen eye. He, he pots everything in sight at the moment. I think uh, maturity will alter his game slightly. Uh, he will uh, learn to be more cautious on certain occasions, which will win him more matches. But uh, there's just a natural ability. Uh, it's just some charisma that young Stephen has. I was uh, very pleased to be on the end of the microphone when he won the Scottish professional title a couple of years ago. I hope I'm on the microphone when he becomes world champion, but uh, it's my guess he'll be a millionaire before he becomes world champion. In terms of total earnings, it's very difficult to say just exactly what the final figure would be. But I think during the course of this year, particularly with his, his progress in the rankings and his tournament winnings, I think we've probably got to look at um, a figure of somewhere around 600,000. Ian knows that um, he can trust me playing a snooker and I know that I can trust him doing the business. Obviously, I have ups and downs all the time. We'll have our little arguments about things, but um, more or less in the end, we we'll always come out um, friends. The cameras then went on to capture one of those little arguments after Hendry lost a match to the 1986 world champion, Joe Johnson. And I mean, I couldn't believe that last frame, that yellow. I mean, what possessed you? I couldn't believe it, you did my brains. <laughs> but you can improve your cue ball control, you can improve everything by practice, but most of all, you can improve the concentration. I don't think you can just make excuses in terms of the amount of work. Well, I mean, excuses for the work. <clears throat> Well, what are you saying? No, I'm saying it was a different situation then than it was now. That's what I'm saying. I'm not making excuses for the amount of work I'm doing. Of course, for getting it's a, beat. of course it's a different situation. Absolutely. And the amount of practice time really is down to you. And you must learn. You don't go on practice tables at tournaments with players. Now, seriously, you've got to stay away from them. Most of the top players know how good you are. Let them worry till match day. Let them sweat it out. You don't want to be building up their confidence. 
It's your confidence we're building up, not theirs. It's OK if you know you've played bad and the other player's played well to beat you and he deserves to win, there's nothing you can do about it. But when it's your own stupidity, um, it's very frustrating. I remember the time in the World Championship against Joe Johnson where um, I had the chance of a, for an easy black to make it 7-7. Seven, seven. Um, but I missed it and he potted it to make it 8-6. I uh, went in the dressing room, Tommy was waiting for me. I threw my cue across the room and I was lucky he caught it. Uh, kicked the door with my foot and I thought I broke my toe because for the next four frames I was limping. But um, it got rid of some of the anger and I went out and I managed to play well because I ended up only one frame behind on it the next day. So I think it must have helped me a bit to get rid of some of the anger. In those early cheap jewellery wearing days, it wasn't just his manager who was urging Hendry on. The young star was also unerringly driven by a simple desire to topple the great Steve Davis. Oh, he's, he's destroyed me really every time I've played him. And he's just played um, Bryant. Although I've played the wrong game, I've went out and I've not shown him, gave him the respect that he deserves. So I, I, I suppose he is my bogeyman in a way. One. And that's enough, the world champion and favourite for this tournament has been toppled by the 18-year-old young Scottish sensation, Stephen Hendry, who goes into the last eight, having taken victory at five frames to two. And so his all-round game was much better, so deserved to win. I think 5-2 uh, was probably about right, really, I think, on the day. If he keeps on putting in performances like that, I think we'll have a few battles in the future. Mm. Is it uh, a coming of age, do you think, for Stephen Henry? Um, I don't know, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, well, I just, I just yeah. uh, changed my game completely the night, that's all. I know you said before that it's not a question of sort of psychological things, but now you've done it. It's out of the way now, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I wasn't really consciously thinking about Steve's always beaten me like, but I just went out there and I played up my skin, really. The young challenger would eventually beat Davis in two consecutive UK Championship finals, but it was Jimmy White who would suffer most at the hand of Hendry. Jimmy White's always been my hero since I started. Um, I seen him in an exhibition in Scotland when I was 13, and he could do things with a cue ball that I'd never seen anyone else do, and it was unbelievable. Um, from then on, he's been my idol. So I can identify most of his game because it's, it's the way I play. I'm sort of, I've never been coached, neither has he. I've just sort of learnt everything myself. <laughs> Young Tom is dead. <laughs> I met Stephen when he was about 14 uh, with his father and I've seen him progress from then and now he's one of probably the strongest, one of the strongest players in the game. He's fearless, he uh, also has a good attacking game and uh, I love to see players like that, you know, I don't like to see players that, no disrespect, they're good in their own right but they don't really give the thrills that the public want to see. And he Stephen is like a prime example of like just, you know, just pure brilliance. I, I, enjoy his game all the time. Although maybe not all the time, Hendry and White met in four World Championship finals, and Hendry won all of them. White's inability to triumph over his friend was painfully captured on children's TV show, Record Breakers. Are you ready? The Wonder Bear and the great comeback merchant digging deep for glory again. He's absolutely right on the brown here. If he can get round for the blue, that's going to be the key shot. Is he on the blue? He's a bit high. He's round very fast. Oh, stop that cue ball! He went on and on forever. In goes the switch to the blue. 17.71. Perfect on the pink. He's round for the black. And then he's on his own. He's still a possibility. White had held the speed record for potting all the colours in 26.01 seconds. <laughs> You've got him, 25-9-0. 25, that was really good. You were pleased with that, huh? Absolutely, yeah. You must have been. Well, Jim... He's done the game. This is where you've got to do the big one. Your last chance. Well, you can do it. Don't let him take this off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Are you ready? Yeah. The whirlwind, his title has been taken away. This is his last chance for Jimmy White to regain it. The Wonder Bairn has beaten him in the World Championships. He's beating him for the fastest player on earth. But Jimmy White won't have that, but he doesn't like the blue. The blue is in terrible trouble for him. His chances are ebbing away. His title is gone! The new world speed super champion is the wonder man, Stephen Hendry. Jimmy White loses his crown. Well, there it is. Gosh, that was exciting, wasn't it? That was really good. Well done. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Mike Clark, for coming along and refereeing for us. That's kind of you. Commiserations to you, Jim. Yeah, I'm terribly mind. sorry. And the new speed snooker champion is now Stephen Hendry. <laughs> <laughs>25th anniversary of that unforgettable final. It was only a bit of fun, but it showed just how much affection remains for all these game-changing players, who turned snooker into a national obsession and made it as unmissable as, uh, well, as a long black off the top cushion into the bottom corner pocket. So, two of today's biggest stars will be back at the table tonight for the Masters Snooker Final. Judd Trump against Mark Williams continues on BBC Two Live from Seven. But coming next, we've a trip to the coast 